Hi everybody, welcome to this week's question and answer video where I'm answering your guys' questions from last week's video. I do this every single Monday. Please go down below in the comment section and ask any questions you want. Um, if I miss your question, ask me again please, I don't do it on purpose. And come back for the next video, next Monday, to see my answer. Let me know what you think of my answer, if I understood your question, if you understand my answer, things like that. No such thing as bad, question only bad answers. So, the only thing I ask of you guys is please Share us your location. Let us know where you're at in the world. You can be vague. And if you would please, if you haven't already, please consider supporting a petition I made last year or more, more, more than a year ago, two years ago almost. Stop Narcissistic Online Bullying. It's at change.org. The link is right down below in the description box and into the comments. You'll see it. You just follow the link <clears throat> and touch it and say you support it. It's global, everyone in the world, and I'd really appreciate it if you could. It's to stop this attacks online to everybody. It's the number one cause of young people taking their lives. So it's it's a big problem, and it's only getting worse. It needs your support. Thank you. All right, let's get into the questions. There's many, many good ones. Hopefully I have good answers. So Joanne Turi says, A new word thrown into the mix is fawning. You can be sympathetic in a fawning way where you go along with them for the sake of it, to keep the peace, then bow out gracefully, peacefully, quietly, the way nobody gets hurt. Yeah, if you're not going to try to fix your problems, you're just going to let it slide and you don't want confrontation or conflict and stuff like this, sure, but that's because you're getting out and then you get out. Yep, we don't just keep doing that and stay. You know? um, we have freeze and uh, or fight and uh, cheese. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. We have danger. We have we fight it or we flight. We leave it. The point of it is that we don't have stress in our lives. That we protect ourselves and we give ourselves what we need. Um, I also wrote down here that that avoiding conflict and confrontation, things like this in relationships, is the number one way to ensure that we are neglected. That this relationship fails. We are sabotaging our relationships when we don't speak up. Okay. Thank you. Fawning, you know, if we fight or flight and get rid of our danger, our stress, they're gone and then we feel good. This is how our nervous system works. If we do not do this, which we can't in childhood, we can't really fight danger. Our parents need to get rid of the stress in our life for us. That's how they teach us to do it. But if we grew up neglected, unfortunately, and we're traumatized and abused, we, we didn't do that. We didn't, we were never taught how to get rid of stress and danger by communicating and protecting ourselves. Instead, fawning means um, that we do nothing. That's what it means. It means we, we do nothing and we stay. <laughs> That's what that means. Um, a traumatic response is to freeze. You know, we do nothing again. The fawning is being submissive. Yeah. But like, like, like you said, your, your statement that I will fawn to avoid danger right now, and as soon as I can, I get away from it. But we do not do this in relationships. Ben from South Florida, hi Ben. Thank you so much for answering my question. It helped a lot, good, thanks for telling me. This week I met with my boss in her office and she wanted to know more personal issues about my upbringing and childhood. I found it odd and told her some things in little detail. She told me after that she loved me and she started to cry and she saw me as her friend, not just an employee. I felt very weird about it. After the week was over and I was emotionally drained and tired and only having 40 bucks after paying my rent at my motel, I told her on Sunday I wasn't feeling good and I was feeling not like myself and I couldn't uh, attend church with her. And all she texted me back was, okay, not are you okay or is everything all right? It was like passive aggressive form of showing her disappointment. I feel so trapped. I have zero money and very little clean clothes left. I feel, I feel trapped with no way out. Thank you, David. Your wisdom is priceless. And I'm really sorry, Ben, for your situation. Ben's been, uh, you've, been you've been commenting the last couple weeks or so about your situation. For those of you who aren't aware of what's going on, to keep it as short and sweet as possible, Ben's had some help. And uh, it was, was struggling with the relationships like we were out on his own financially struggling a woman seemed to help ben and and let and hired him for some work and he works with her and she's married and uh, <clears throat> he works with her and she gets very personal 
uh, talks to him after work, outside of work, wants him to hang out with her and her husband, go to church on Sundays. So he basically is with her every single day of the week. And she's, she gets real personal into his personal life and asks inappropriate or personal questions that Ben's not comfortable with. And says things that are inappropriate. Like, you're the most interesting man in the, I've ever met. And she's married. I'm not interesting. Um, and cries and says, uh, you're my friend, like this. Um, it makes Ben uncomfortable and Ben is not sure what to do. He's kind of in a situation where she's helping him and he feels obliged for the, everything that she wants from him. And uh, that, what, how she responded, okay, obviously she's not happy with that response. And, and you didn't like that she's not even concerned, you know. The concerns are for her only. And, and maybe her feelings and stuff are for her only. Okay. I wrote here. Thank you, Ben. And I'm sorry. You're never trapped. So what you can do. You feel trapped though. I know that. So what you can do. So what can you do to help yourself not feel this way? Try to not internalize anything she does. And know that she is simply being who she is. She is disappointed. I think that's clear. Which means she expects something more from you, Ben. Because she's not considering how you feel or what you need or want, only herself. And I suggested that you do the same. Okay, you do that. You be concerned with what you need, what you want, and how you feel. Okay, I'm sorry for the situation you are in, Ben. There's more than one way out. If you need help, you're not sure, ask someone, okay? Ruth from the United Kingdom. Hello, Ruth. Mental healing takes so, so much longer than physical healing. Maybe why people self-harm. Yeah, emotional. Emotional healing. Emotional pain is the worst. Emotional needs are more important than physical needs. And emotional pain and hurt is more than physical pain and hurt. And when our emotional pain hurts so badly, there are some people that will hurt themselves physically to counter it, to numb it out, to, to be more hurting on the outside than the inside. Yeah, you're right. And hi, David Healing family from California here. Hello. Thank you a million for all your thoughts and answers. I proudly share with my therapist, family, co-workers, who the first person to help me understand what I was going through and in my healing journey was, that is you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Another question. Ex-fiance was suffering with a lot of anxiety, fear of abandonment, and all BBD symptoms and traits. Since he was always artsy, since he was always antsy, picking at his beard and eating roots. I've heard other people doing that. Couldn't be in one spot for a long time, etc. I always wondered if he was consuming hardcore drugs, even though he always said he didn't. What are the signs that someone with BPD can also be consuming drugs? Can you give lots of examples? No, I can't. The reason is, is because it's so close to being the same. As a matter of fact, it's so close, so similar in behaviors that a Therapist, mental health professional, cannot diagnose someone with borderline personality disorder if they're under the influence of drugs. Interesting, huh? Can't do it. If the therapist knows that they're taking drugs, they're under the influence of drugs, they can't diagnose them. Not with that. It's that close, that similar, right? Emotional instability, fluctuating through moods and affect and emotions, extreme impulsivity and run out the door and get high. Everything's going great and just ruins it and throws it away and sabotages themselves and may talk about suicide. Really scared that you'll leave them. All, the, all of it. All of it. Yeah. Pretty amazing. So you're asking me to come up with a symptom or sign of drugs or uh, of someone using drugs that's also borderline. And you would need to know their baseline. You would need to know who they are when you know they're not on drugs, right? I mean, if this was, you know, parents that have children and raise them and then the child doesn't get into drugs until late high school or college, they can usually pick up on that because they're so different. Yeah. Even a borderline, if a borderline is even high on the spectrum and very low functioning, they have a baseline. And if they're going to do drugs, they're going to be more. They're going to be more unstable and more impulsive. So it's hard to sit there and tell you, right? Well, they'll be, they'll be impulsive. And, you're, and you say, well, yeah, he's very impulsive. Okay, but is he impulsive when he's not on drugs? And you say, I don't know. 
Is he, you know, do you see what I'm saying? You, you, you can go with some obvious drug signs. I mean, they got track marks on their arm. Yeah, you, you find contraband. They hang out with other people that are known drug addicts. Stuff like that. Um, you know, some signs that people are drug addicts, you know, may, maybe the, you know, drug addicts are doing drugs 24 seven. They get high, they come down. Sometimes they can't get any, sometimes they don't have any, sometimes they don't do something while at work. So maybe there's those times where you see their eyes really, really dilated, but they're not angry and they're, they're not excited. They're just kind of acting normal, but their eyes are so dilated when usually they aren't that dilated. And yes, they'll lose their shit sometimes and go crazy and angry. And then their eyes are super dilated. But I'm talking about when their eyes are like that and then they're not. They're mellow. That could be a sign. Yeah. Not sleeping all night. Sleeping all day all of a sudden. White marks on your nose. I mean, right? Stupid, but. Money's all gone. No, no accountability of where the money went. Um. Do they have a history? It's good to know. History of drugs. Alcohol. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones here. It's difficult. It's like besides those just real easy things that we look for, it's difficult. We kind of have to know who they are and know, and know how different they are. Now they're on drugs. Right? But he could... Very well, not be taking any drugs. Not be taking any drugs because he's borderline, he looks like he is. And he could very well not be borderline at all. But, but right now, you just say, God, he has every trait because he's on drugs. Uh, these are pervasive patterns, so the longer that you know him, you know, you, you, if you know someone for a month and they meet all the requirements for borderline, that, that's still situational until you know them longer. Uh, sorry, I can't help you more with that. Anybody else wants to chime in and say, what would you think? What do you guys think? Can you think of any signs that someone is using drugs and they're borderline? So it have to be nothing that has to do with borderline? It's kind of hard, isn't it? Rose from the United Kingdom. Hello, Rose. Is it just me? I bet not. I bet not you're the only one that thinks or feels what you're about to say. Is it just me? I've always noticed an extreme behavior always feels as though they are waiting for you to do something wrong. Then pounce. You will mess up eventually. They seem perfect or somehow trying to be perfect. People are drawn to him though. Hardly speak to me. Strangers look at him and smile, engage with him. Those are people who do not know who he is and you are the one who knows who he is. Okay? That's why people that don't know who he is treat him with respect and like him, right? And people who know who he is can't stand him. Uh, yeah, walking on eggshells, waiting for you to do something wrong. His own, uh, here, here's what I wrote. He is the narcissist. He knows he is inadequate and must do everything he can to overcompensate for this. That's why it's like that. But you don't need to, Rose. You don't, you don't think, you, you don't think you have all these inadequacies you need to make up for and overcompensate for. Rob from Australia. Can borderlines narcissists have successful careers, relationships, etc.? Sure. I can't say that they can't have a successful relationship. How would I know? I don't know all of them. <laughs> the odds are definitely stacked against them. Yeah. But if I say no, they can't have successful relationships, I'll have 100 people with a disorder telling me that they can and I'm wrong. I don't know anything. So it's easy when you say all, like if, you know, can all, no. Can all do this? No. Um, and, I, and I know they can have successful careers. That's different. Someone with borderline personality disorder has emotional problems. It's their personal life that's affected more. Relationships. And they're in that, that, that's a specific part of their brain that manages and controls that part of their life. They have another part of their brain over here that manages their work life. So when they're in their work life, they're out of their personal life. We can't be in both. If we try, we make mistakes. It's stressful. 
So a lot of people become workaholics because their personal life is completely unmanageable. I don't believe anybody that just says, I don't like personal life. I, I, I'm totally successful in my personal life. Just don't like it. All I care about is work. Yeah. <clears throat> um, some careers I know diagnosed borderlines have that they're successful in. I've heard attorneys and lawyers. Um, the most common profession, it has to be, it's the most common profession by far I've ever heard that people with this disorder get into. Psychology. Psychology, psychologists, therapists, caseworkers, social workers, the most common, the most toxic person in the world I've ever heard, their career, child therapy, child psychologists. It, it's profound. I mean, the second someone says, I'm a therapist, I'm like, eh, radar goes up. And they say, child therapist, I'm like, two radars up. Sad. Sad when you think of uh, people that obviously mistreat and hate old people become senior caretakers. People that can't stand babies and mistreat them and kill them become babysitters, baby caretakers, right? Priests take vow of celibacy. And what do some of them do? It's interesting the line of work that we get into. The most common line of work for someone traumatized and can't heal or don't know how to heal or refuse to look at themselves and heal is to try to care for others. It's the, it's the same as a codependent. Your life's easier to manage than mine. And if I can help you, then I'm okay. If I know how to make you heal or help you heal, then then I'm okay, right? If people around me are more sick than me, I'm healthy. Think of that. Think of a really high spectrum, low functioning borderline that somehow makes it through school and somehow gets a job being a therapist. They can't have really any kind of friendships. They may have a boyfriend or girlfriend that they neglect horribly and maybe even abuse. They don't have people healthy in their life at all, but they have a job where they help all these people, all these unhealthy people around them and need their help, look up to them. And they help manage their help. They say, you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. And I help people get better. I'm great. It's so common, it's not even funny. You can look on YouTube. You can look for people that try to help people with psychology and many of them, I don't think are very healthy. I don't think they went through what they are telling others that they need to go through. Just my opinion. Thanks, Rob. Let me know what you think. Victoria from the Bay Area. Hello, Victoria. A few years back, I was taking my son to school when I noticed a young boy hanging from a tree. Yes, that kind of hanging, swinging from his neck. Unfortunately, the kids in the playground also saw this. Do you think this is going to cause these kids psychological damage in the future? It was pretty bad, David. How awful. Uh, do you think this is going to cause these kids psychological damage in the future? It can. doesn't have to, but it can. Yeah. We all re react differently to things like this, okay? Everyone. We all have totally different brains, completely different brains. We, had, we grew up in different environments. We are some of them, a lot, you know, different cultures we're in. So this is trauma. And children, as funny as this may sound, children can handle trauma. And you might say, well, David, it's trauma. That means they can't handle it. So I get it. They have a traumatic event, but they can be okay afterwards. Or it can make them, you know, very sick, very ill, very uh, cause of mental illness, you know, in their life. Could they have addictions forever from things like this? Sure. It can affect them all kinds of different ways. What is vitally important are their caretakers. The people who help them comfort themselves because children can't, can they? Children can't care for themselves. Children can't protect themselves. It's the caretaker's job to do that. So what happens to these children is up to the caretakers. If they have a mom and dad who are healthy and emotionally responsive and they provide security and love him, make him feel better, you want to talk to somebody, things like this, that child probably will be okay. That, you know, take some time. If their mom and dad don't want to hear anything about it to the point where the child doesn't even want to tell mom and dad, 
or the dad and mom tell them to shut up or they're fighting or drinking alcohol, they don't care, that child could be brutally damaged for the rest of their life. See that? See how important our caretakers are for us when we're children? Adults who get PTSD were more prone to it because of their childhood. They probably already had it. That's what I'm discovering. You take three soldiers in a foxhole in a battle and the soldier in the middle gets, you know, head blown off. But only one of the two soldiers in that foxhole gets PTSD. Why? Why? We all react differently. We were learning that the soldier who responded that way and has now has PTSD, we're learning that he was neglected in childhood and was traumatized. The other soldier was not. I'm healed, but it doesn't mean it can't come back. I have to care for myself and make sure that that doesn't happen. Let me know what you think, Victoria. What a sad, sad thing for children to see. Emily from South Africa. Hello, Emily. Why do things feel like they get louder when you go to a new place? Is it something that just happens to us or is it a usual result from stress? Well, a new place could be a little stressful for everyone. It can be. But your brain is looking for new dangers. That's why. If you were to go to the same mall that you work at every day, you get pretty relaxed. Yeah. If you go to the same mall every day for two years and work and nothing bad happens, that's for sure, nothing bad happens, feels good to go to the mall, feels good to go to work. It's comfortable, right? <clears throat> if you are traumatized in your home for two years from your boyfriend or girlfriend, that place will cause more stress. Even if the you and you, both of you break up, never talk to each other again, you might feel stress for a year in your home because all the bad things that happen, all the bad dangers your brain associates all that place with. But when you go to a new place, there's no new dangers. You have no, you have no history of danger. You have no experiences yet there. But your brain will be on alert, looking for dangers. Your eyesight will work better, your smell, your sound, your, your, your hearing. And that does take some cortisol and adrenaline, things like that. But you're, you should be okay. Most everybody is okay to go to a new place and have a little bit, a little bit beyond high alert a little bit. It doesn't cause anxiety. I tell my clients to get out of their house. The ones that feel the worst, they come to me and say, David, I need help and I need help right now. I, I make them leave. Just leave. Get out of there. Get out of your house. Get out of the town. And instantly their brain relaxes because we're not in that area anymore. All those dangers are not dangerous to us anymore. We're not there anymore. And we're in a new place. And your, your brain will be high, on high alert looking for dangers. But it's nothing compared to the trauma, the traumatic experiences you had over here at home. And so you'll go on vacation and you just... You know, it's like, oh, finally, some relief. And, and then, you know, the cortisol and the adrenaline, looking for it, that's nothing. You're having a good time. And then you go back home, and it comes back up again. So we need to fix that. But it shouldn't be as bad. That's why, Emily, cortisol is making your everything work better, harder, faster. Works well. Uh, Rose again in the United Kingdom. Hi, Rose. Why is he so military with time, extreme with routine, forever watching, repeats? They can suck your time away. Vampires of time. Yeah, vampires of energy is worse. The time is up to you. Uh, I wrote because he lacks self-control and tries to control his environment. If I can't control myself, remember, I can't manage myself, I manage you. And then you'll have people that feel out of control and they'll try to control their environment and not accept things they can't control. What can I do? I got to do something. I can do something. What should I do? What should I do? And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. How about just, you, there's nothing you can do. Just accept that. Nope. So he also cannot handle any kind of change very well. Can he? No change, right? The scheduling. Oh gosh. I can't wait for you. 
He's not very accepting. He's not agreeable. Yeah, doesn't value respect for your time at all. And you know this, Rose. You know that he has. You know that he doesn't value respect of any kind. He's not respectful to you. He's not respectful of your peace, of your time, of your space, of your money, of your belongings. Nothing. He, he doesn't value respect. So he, he really doesn't respect anything that has to do with you. And I'm sorry, Rose. I hope you change that someday. That's all, guys. Thank you for your awesome questions. Um, if you think this is beneficial, if you like the message that I'm spreading, if you like what I'm doing, you want to support me and help this, all you have to do is subscribe to the channel down below. You can like the video. You can comment down below, ask questions, stuff like that. Okay, um, let me know what you think of my answers, everybody. And please try to have a beautiful week. Thank you. I love you. Uh, love yourself first. Bye bye.